Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers the right to film, reasonable suspicion, and control of law enforcement, and is brought to us by Siberian Tigers Channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. In a video posted on February 28, 2024, First Amendment auditor Siberian Tiger, who we will refer to as Mr. Tiger, was filming as he walked on a public sidewalk in Portland, Oregon. When he walked in front of the Portland Bureau of Police building, he began to film inside the police cruisers parked in front of it from the sidewalk and street, attracting the attention of Sergeant Edwards. The interaction that followed was captured by Mr. Tiger as he continued to film after Sergeant Edwards approached him. Uh, who are you? Huh? Who are you? I don't know. What are you, what are you doing? You are don't you know taking, who? Are you taking close-up pictures of the inside of the car? You can't do that, okay? Says who? Says me. Uh, who are you? I don't know. Well then, okay, you get lost. Be, you cannot be taking pictures of the inside of these cars. Watch me. You cannot be taking pictures of the inside of the cars. Who okay. are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? You come over here all big tough guy? Hey, you can't be taking pictures inside the Says car. who? Says me. It's a police car, okay? And you, who are you? I'm a sergeant, okay? I'm a supervisor. Yeah? Okay, yeah. And? 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 And you can't be here And you that. can get lost. It doesn't work that way, my friend. How does that work? Hey. What? You're going to get in my face go, like this? Go find something else You think you're going to intimidate me? I'm intimidating you, man. You then what's the problem? I don't know. I'm wondering what the problem is with you. You can over here, old tough guy. I'm wondering what the problem is with you. you there was no problem. What am I doing? You can't be taking pictures. Of the Says who? Says me. What law? I don't know. Exactly. Yeah, so get know. lost, tough guy. It doesn't work that way. Well, how's it going to work? I don't know. Why don't there you call you your bobbies over here? Why don't you call your lieutenant? No. Other sergeants? Can you show me out in front of the precinct with yeah. taking some pictures of inside of the police <laughs> Dumb guy. I'll take it. <laughs> taking pictures of the yeah. inside of the vehicles that are public property. I'm on the public sidewalk taking pictures of everything that is open, visible from my eyes, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Which is First Amendment protected activity and oh, the tough oh, guy shows up here and tells me I can't take pictures. Mr. Tiger contends that his actions in filming the inside of police vehicles from a public street are protected by the First Amendment. In the 1995 case of Fordyce versus Seattle, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has jurisdiction over Oregon, recognized the, quote, First Amendment right to film matters of public interest. Likewise, in the 2018 case of Askins versus U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the Ninth Circuit specifically noted that this right included, quote, the right to record law enforcement officers engaged in the exercise of their official duties in public places. In the Askins case, two border policy advocates who were stopped and searched by officers after they took photographs of ports of entry on the United States-Mexico border from public property challenged a customs and border protection policy that required members of the media to obtain advance permission to film outside of ports of entry buildings. In discussing the constitutionality of this policy, the court noted that, quote, the government's ability to regulate speech in a traditional public forum, such as a street, sidewalk, or park is sharply circumscribed, and that in such public forums, now quoting again, content-based restrictions on speech are subject to strict scrutiny and may only be upheld if they are the least restrictive means available to further a compelling government interest. Although the Ninth Circuit recognized that, now quoting, without question, protecting our territorial integrity is a compelling interest that could justify reasonable restrictions on speech activities at ports of entry, it clarified that, now quoting again, it is the government's burden to prove that these specific restrictions are are the least restrictive means available to further its compelling interest, and that the government could not justify the restrictions through general assertions of national security, particularly in traditional public forums. Now, while it is important to note that an area is not automatically a traditional public forum simply because it is open to the public, the public streets and sidewalks that Mr. Tiger was filming from are the type of quote-unquote quintessential public forums that the Supreme Court recognized in the 1983 case of Perry Education Association versus Perry Local Educators Association, now quoting again, which by long tradition or by government fiat have been devoted to assembly and debate. And while the officers repeatedly asserted that Mr. Tiger could not film the interiors of the police vehicles, the cruisers were openly parked on the street in front of the Portland Police Bureau, which is an area surrounded by parks, museums, and restaurants. And Mr. Tiger did not film anything that any member of the general public on the street could not see. Additionally, courts have consistently held that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in public. 
Although much of this case law focuses on whether an officer's conduct invaded a citizen's Fourth Amendment rights. For example, in the 1997 case of State v. Orlovsky, the Oregon Court of Appeals concluded that when an officer on the sidewalk, quote, looked in the window of a truck, anything he saw at that point was in plain view. Thus, the court determined that the individual could not argue that the officer violated a reasonable expectation of privacy by looking inside the vehicle because, now quoting, he exposed himself to public view by parking on a public street. Accordingly, a court would likely conclude that all of Mr. Tiger's filming was protected by the First Amendment, and that a prohibition on filming inside police vehicles from public vantage points would be a constitutional violation, as a much less restrictive way for the police department to protect confidential data would be to ensure that no such information is visible from the public streets and sidewalks. Taking pictures of the inside of the car is that's... Is, oh, is that, you uh, too? You want to get on my case too about taking pictures? What are you doing taking pictures? Of the what am I doing taking pictures? What's the problem with taking pictures? pictures of the inside of the vehicle from the computer. What law is that? What am I breaking? I don't know. That's called private property. You can't. You that's, can't. That's you private can, property. Come here. You can't. Come you, here, sergeant. You can't take a picture. Come here, sergeant. Vehicle. Come here. No, I don't need to come here. I'm good. What it says over here? Take a of the outside if you like. What does it say? I don't know. What does it say? You tell me. You don't know how to read? No. Any of you guys know how to read? What's your goal, sir? What do you need today? I was minding my own business. This guy comes over here, gets in my face, and no, you and gives me unlawful directives. So, hey, sir, can you understand why we may? Be I don't need to understand the, anything. Well, I'm gonna explain why he was concerned. Okay? Why? So we could be concerned that somebody is targeting our police vehicles or is looking inside there to see confidential information on the screen or in other things. Okay. So The officers expressed potential concerns regarding Mr. Tiger targeting police vehicles or attempting to access confidential information. It is possible that Mr. Tiger's conduct in filming inside the vehicles could provide the officers with reasonable suspicion to detain him because while looking or recording the inside of vehicles is not a crime, it could indicate potential future illegal behavior such as criminal mischief or theft. For instance, section 164.365 and section 164.354 of the Oregon Revised Statutes, which respectively define the offenses of first and second degree criminal mischief, prohibit damaging or destroying the property of another. Additionally, section 164.345 of the Revised Statutes outlines criminal mischief in the third degree, which requires, now quoting, intent to cause substantial inconvenience by tampering or interfering with the property of another. The Supreme Court has repeatedly held that the actual motivations of individual officers do not play a role in determining the so-called reasonableness of a seizure under the Fourth Amendment. For instance, in the 1978 case of Scott v. United States, the court noted that, quote, the fact that the officer does not have the state of mind which is hypothecated by the reasons which provide the legal justification for the officer's action does not invalidate the action taken, as long as the circumstances, viewed objectively, justify that action. However, organ courts have interpreted Article 1, Section 9 of the state constitution, which, like the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures, also requires both an objective and a subjective component. As the Supreme Court of Oregon concluded in the 2017 case of State v. Maciel Figueroa, quote, For a court to determine that an investigative stop was lawful under Article 1, Section 9, the court, one, must find that the officers actually suspected that the stop person had committed a specific crime or type of crime, or was about to commit a specific crime or type of crime, and two, must conclude, based on the record, that the officer's subjective belief, their suspicion, was objectively reasonable under the totality of the circumstances existing at the time of the stop. The court also noted that suspicion of non-specific criminal activity and quote-unquote officer intuition alone were both insufficient to establish reasonable suspicion. Now in this situation, it is unclear whether the officers actually and objectively suspected Mr. Tiger of criminal conduct, as they stated that they could be concerned that he was targeting the police vehicles or trying to view confidential information, and it is possible that they were simply using this argument to justify their orders to Mr. Tiger to stop filming inside of the vehicles. As such, if the officers did attempt to detain Mr. Tiger based on his conduct, he would have a strong argument that the seizure was unreasonable, particularly under the standard required by the Oregon State Constitution. This is a reasonable Whose responsibility to reasonable, protect confidential it information? Is, it is reasonable. Whose responsibility? Responsibility. It's reasonable Great. to ask. Is it your responsibility to protect confidential okay. information? Uh, sir. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So next time when a when a law abiding citizen inspects his own property, that's your property. and you're my servant, that's oh, my property. That's your property. Everything that's on you, my property, except your personal effects. Okay. This building, my property. Okay. This vehicle, my property. 
you all, you, 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 every one of you work for me. I tell you what to do. I tell you how to do it. I right? pay your wages. Is that right? That's right. How and you work? answer to how me. So when you get on my case, okay. being a law-abiding citizen, quiet. I'm not talking to you. Okay. Quiet. When, when I'm a law-abiding citizen and you get in my face and you start threatening me Nobody and you call your bobbies out here assuming that I'm a, a criminal Nobody because you intend to do something against me, guess what? What are you going to do? You're going to get a piece of my action. What are you going to do? My freedom of speech. Now you're all of us. Mr. Tiger claims that the police department's property is his property and that he has the authority to tell officers what to do and how to do it because he pays their wages, presumably based on his status as a taxpayer. Now, while it is reasonable to assume that Mr. Tiger was speaking in hyperbole, it is important to understand that the fact that property is owned by the government does not mean that any citizen can access or exercise control over any part of it at any time. For instance, in the 1966 case of Adderley versus Florida, the Supreme Court established that the government entity that owns or operates property also has the right to restrict its use, reasoning that the state, now quoting, has power to preserve the property under its control for the use to which it is lawfully dedicated, and that, now quoting again, the United States Constitution does not forbid a state to control the use of its own property for its own lawful, non-discriminatory purpose. Now, although this case was in the context of real property, the same principle applies to personal property owned by the government. As such, the city of Portland owns and controls the cruisers in question, not Mr. Tiger. Additionally, Mr. Tiger's argument that he has the authority to tell officers what to do is inaccurate. While a type of government known as a direct democracy allows ordinary citizens to participate in everyday decision-making regarding laws and policies, the United States is a representative democracy. Under this form of government, citizens elect representatives, such as legislatures and executives, to make decisions regarding regarding laws and policies. Elected officials may then delegate authority to agencies and appointed officials to assist in the administration of the government, who then may hire employees to assist with these tasks. In Portland, the Bureau of Police, as the primary policing agency, reports to the city government, which has allowed the Bureau a significant amount of discretion when it comes to spending and policy making. Accordingly, while taxpayers may attempt to influence government policies and spending through various political and legal processes, the local government government directly, quote-unquote, controls the Portland police and its property, not the taxpayers. In fact, even in a direct democracy, an individual off the street would not have the authority to tell a police officer what to do based solely on their status as a citizen and taxpayer. We have a lot of things we need to Get do. back to your job! I didn't call you! Everywhere. I didn't call you! We're here until Who called you? Are not here. So Who called you? On? What do you want? Who called you? Your Who situation, called you? your scene, your level of engagement yeah. is going to make the police be here. And I do think that's your goal. I no. literally think what you are doing is trying to create a scene to get police attention. Ask her. It on Ask her. I was walking down. I was on walking on a sidewalk. And have this interaction I was walking be on a sidewalk. To you very online, quietly. On a YouTube channel. Whatever you think. So whatever your goals are. I don't are, care what you think. I want you to know very clearly, sir. That's right. You are taking up valuable resources that could be helpful. The city Did I call you? Because we are focused Great. on you. Here's how you can end this. So I think that's important. This is how you can end this. What do you need? Go back to your job and mind your own damn business. You need to not point your camera inside of police vehicles and record information off of our computers. According to whom? Don't do it. According to whom? That's it. According to whom? Sir, what law is that? Okay. It, it, what law is that sir. given ORS code that tells me okay. that tells me that I am not lawfully allowed to look at anything that my eyes can see on a public sidewalk. Okay. What law is that? We are going to leave, and we understand that you are not going to point inside of cameras Unless and Unless I'm breaking the law, computers. you can take your orders. You stay on public hell property. You stay out of a roadway. You understand? You stay out of the roadway. I'm protesting at this point, property. so I will stand wherever the hell I want. Have a good day, sir. Get lost. That's how you should have reacted in the first place. You come out here and you harass me, a law-abiding citizen, that's the reaction you're going to get. Servants, get lost. Sick and tired of police officers harassing law-abiding citizens every day.
After the officers walked away from Mr. Tiger, he continued to film in the area, including the exterior and interior of several police cruisers without additional interference from law enforcement. When Mr. Tiger posted the video of this interaction on his YouTube channel, he explained in the description of the video that he was fed up with high-ranking officers who did not understand the First Amendment. So he, and I'm quoting, let them have it. He also stated that, and I'm quoting him directly here, as always, it seems not a single cop is concerned that anyone walking by can see with their eyes their open and on computer screens. But the moment you record, well, that somehow makes you a suspicious person. Mr. Tiger did not indicate whether he filed a complaint or intends to pursue legal action against anyone involved in the encounter. Overall, the Portland police officers get a C- minus because although they did not illegally detain or arrest Mr. Tiger, they attempted to interfere with his First Amendment right to film. And Sergeant Edwards in particular maintained an authoritarian and unprofessional demeanor throughout the interaction. In attempting to prohibit Mr. Tiger from recording, the officers demonstrated a fundamental misunderstanding regarding the powerful protections granted to filming by the First Amendment, particularly in traditional public forums such as sidewalks and streets. As Mr. Tiger pointed out, it is the officer's responsibility to protect any confidential information, and they could easily alleviate any concerns by simply ensuring that such details were not visible to everyday citizens walking by the cruisers. And while it would be reasonable for the officers to be concerned about an individual showing an excessive level of interest in their vehicles, the proper course of action would be to attempt to engage in a consensual encounter with Mr. Tiger to determine why he was filming, or to simply observe his conduct to ensure he did not tamper with the vehicles. Instead, the officers chose to attempt to unconstitutionally restrict Mr. Tiger's First Amendment rights by ordering him not to film what was visible to him and the general public on a public street. Mr. Tiger gets an A- minus because although he raised his voice and made some rude comments to the officers, he remained within his First Amendment rights throughout the encounter, both in his filming and his speech, and refused to comply with the officers' attempts to unconstitutionally restrict his speech. Although Mr. Tiger was incorrect in his assertions regarding his individual level of control over the officers and government property, he may well have been speaking in hyperbole to illustrate the fact that the police bureau and the officers must answer to the taxpayers. Overall, Mr. Tiger did an excellent job defending and explaining his First Amendment right to film, and I commend him for his tenacity and his commitment to protecting the Constitution. I would encourage him to persist in his First Amendment advocacy by continuing to conduct audits and demand accountability from police officers. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic that you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.